Yacht A, my relatives, this is Mark Charles. I hope everybody's doing well. I wanted to uh, reach out to you today. I want to actually take some time to talk about some stuff that's been going on in the campaign these past few uh, weeks, especially coming out of the Republican and Democratic National Conventions. Um, before I begin, let me just uh, honor the people whose land I'm on. I'm once again speaking to you from uh, Washington, D.C., which is the land of the Piscataway. And I am very grateful for the Piscataway. I want to honor them for their stewardship of these lands and acknowledge that they are still here. Uh, they were here long before Columbus got lost at sea, and they have been stewarding these years for hundreds, even thousands of years. And I am deeply humbled and honored to be on these lands, and I want to thank the Piscataway people for their stewardship of these lands. In the uh, Republican National Convention, there was a lot of talk about what's called American exceptionalism. And in fact, Donald Trump said he was very excited about American exceptionalism and he wanted to begin teaching it in, in our schools. Um, I don't know if he knows this or not, but American, exceptional, American exceptionalism is already broadly taught in our schools. Um, it's one of the main themes of our entire historical curriculum of the United States. It's a myth that is propagated by, by our school system, is propagated by our media, by our movies, by our politicians. American exceptionalism is one of the most deeply ingrained myths of this nation that gets poured into your, into your head the moment you're born or you become a citizen or you, you come into these lands. It's, it's something that is broadly accepted. It's a bipartisan value. It's a danger, it's a myth, it's not true. There's no such thing as American exceptionalism. But it's a myth that this nation re is adamant about teaching, about spreading, about propagating, and it's a bipartisan value. As many of you know, I wrote a book, co-authored a book. It's called Unsettling Truths, The Ongoing Dehumanizing Legacy of the Doctrine of Discovery. The book was published last November in 2019, and it's based on research that I've been doing and, and work that other people have been doing for decades to understand the doctrine of discovery and how deeply it's embedded into the foundations of our nation. And uh, in our book, we talk about this myth of American exceptionalism, and I want to just highlight for you a few places where in my research, in my analysis, I begin to see the birth of this lie, this myth we call American exceptionalism. The Doctrine of Discovery, which was written between 1452 and 1493, these series of papal bulls, edicts of the Catholic Church, it's essentially the church in Europe saying to the nations of Europe, wherever you go, whatever lands you find not ruled by white European Christian rulers, those people are subhuman and their land is yours to take. Now we have to be aware that this is a church doctrine. Okay? It's a church doctrine that gets, that gets put out justifying the actions of the state, the states mostly of European nations. And this doctrine, this doctrine of discovery that came out of the Catholic Church gets embedded into our foundations. That's why the Declaration of Independence refers to natives as merciless Indian savages. That's why the Constitution that begins with the words, we the people, Article 1, Section 2, never mentions women, specifically excludes natives, counts Africans as three-fifths. This doctrine of discovery, this white supremacist doctrine gets deeply embedded into the foundations. It's even into our Supreme Court case precedents. I don't have time to go into that right now. There's a TEDx talk I gave called We the People, the three most misunderstood words in U.S. history. If you search it, you'll find it. Watch that. I go in depth into how even the Supreme Court and Ruth Bader Ginsburg buy into this myth of the doctrine, into this, this lie, this heresy known as the doctrine of discovery. But initially, the Protestant church pushed back against the doctrine. This was a Catholic doctrine. The Reformation, the, Catholic, the, the, the Protestant church was kind of going on its own little other path, and they pushed back against the doctrine of discovery. In 1630, John Winthrop, who was a Protestant pastor, and he was on board a ship in what now is called the Boston Harbor, and he was here with a group of people to plant the Boston colony. And on board the ship, he preached a sermon called A Model of Christian Charity. In his sermon, 
he referred to the people he was with as a city upon a hill. Now that sounds familiar because politicians, both Democrats and Republicans, throughout our nation's history have used this term to refer to the myth of American exceptionalism. This term a city upon a hill comes from actually the teachings of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, where he tells his disciples to be a lamp on a stand, a city on a hill, shining their good deeds into this dark world. Now John Winthrop in his sermon goes on and he, he says to the colonists that he's with, in his sermon, he says, In all meekness, gentleness, patience, and liberality, they should rejoice together, mourn together, labor and suffer together. They should keep the unity of the Spirit in the bonds of peace. These are just your basic Christian exhortations that you would find in almost any Protestant church. However, at the end of his sermon, John Winthrop wanted to motivate his congregants to listen to his exhortations, to heed his words. And so he began to reference a passage from the Old Testament, from Deuteronomy chapter 30 most specifically. And in this passage, it says, But if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey, and we worship other gods, we will surely perish out of the good land whether we pass over this river to possess it. Now, John Winthrop was trying to motivate the people to listen to his teachings. And so he referenced this passage from the Old Testament that is literally God saying to the people of Israel, motivating them through the threats and promises of his promised lands. If you obey me, I'll do these things for you. If you disobey me, I'll do these things to you. It says, if our hearts shall turn away so that we will not obey and we worship other gods, we will surely perish out of the good land whether we pass over this river to possess it. Now, Deuteronomy 30 says river. But in his sermon, John Winthrop changes the word river to vast sea. Why would he do that? Well, because he didn't cross a river. He crossed an ocean. So what's he communicating to his audience? Based on the exhortations of Jesus to be a city on a hill, based on the land covenant that God gave to the people of Israel, they are standing on the shores of their promised lands, ready to go and take possession of them. This is why John Winthrop changes the wording from river to vast sea. I call this sermon the birth of American exceptionalism. Now, if you read the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua from the Old Testament, you will see what it means for a nation to have promised lands. In Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 through 17, it says, however, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them. According to the book of Deuteronomy, according to the word of the God of Abraham, promised land for one people is literally God-ordained genocide for another. That's how the story of promised land plays out throughout both the books of Deuteronomy and Joshua. Again, I call this sermon the birth of American exceptionalism. That idea, this is the 1630s, that idea percolates for about 100 years. Mid, early to mid 1700s, our nation begins expanding, expanding westward. We go past the Appalachian Mountains, we go past the Mississippi River. End of the 1700s, there's the Second Great Awakening, there's this growth in churches, a renewal of de denominations. Early 1800s, around 1840, the term manifest destiny is coined. This belief that this white European Christian nation has the God-given right to rule these lands, Turtle Island, from sea to shining sea. Now you're thinking, Mr. Charles, that that's you're over the top. That's we don't really. That was the 1800s. We don't believe that anymore. This is this is a different America today. No, it's actually very much a part of the mythology of our nation. Just think back just a few years ago, right? In 2015, Prime Minister Netanyahu was in the U.S. and he was lobbying against the Iran nuclear deal, the same nuclear deal that President Trump has since pulled out of. And while President Obama was negotiating this deal, President, our Prime Minister Netanyahu came to the U.S. to lobby against it, and he was invited by um, the Speaker of the House 
to give a, a speech to the joint session of Congress, which was unprecedented because normally it's the president who would invite a head of state. But this time it was the, Secre the, the Speaker of the House from the opposing party who did this. And so there was a protest. And this was during the Obama administration when, again, just like today, Congress was very divided. It was very partisan. Members of Congress weren't even talking to each other. They couldn't agree on almost anything. And Benjamin Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, had to thread the needle and had to find a way to get both Democrats and Republicans, people from both sides of the aisle, behind him as he lobbied against this nuclear deal that was being negotiated with Iran. And so he hit upon one of the most unifying themes in American politics, which is the theme of American exceptionalism. And he said to our Congress, because America and Israel, we share a common destiny, the destiny of promised lands. It's a bipartisan applause. See, the United States and the modern nation state of Israel have a very dysfunctional and codependent relationship. It has almost nothing to do with equality or justice or freedom. We need Israel's Old Testament legacy of promised lands to justify what we did to Native Americans and African people. And the modern nation state of Israel needs our flourishing as a nation with a manifest destiny to justify what they do to Bedouins and Palestinians. We have a very dysfunctional, codependent relationship with the modern nation state of Israel which is completely dependent on this misappropriation of this understanding of promised lands, which both our nations claim to have, even in the year 2020. I want to talk a little bit about our history. If you go back to the 19th century, specifically looking, I looked specifically at 1819 through 1920. The 19th century was primarily, we refer to it in our history books, as a century of expansion. This was the century we added about 30 new states to the Union. This was the century we completed our manifest destiny. This was the century we, we became a nation from sea to shining sea. If you look back at our history throughout the 19th century, you will see that we spent, actually, I, I did a graph, and I show this in my lectures. I don't have it here online right now. But I did a graph looking at our nation's history from 1775 to 2020. And you see, when you look at that graph, I, I laid out all of the years that we were in a declared state of war against any nation or entity. You'll see that probably 80% of our years between 1775 and 2020, we spent in some sort of declared state of war or armed military conflict against another nation or entity. Then I highlighted all the years that we were fighting against Native peoples. And more than half of those years, we were in some sort of declared state of war against Native peoples. We spent almost 75 straight years of warfare against Native peoples during the 19th century. It was during the 19th century that we passed the Indian Removal Act in 1830. This was the act of Congress that allowed Andrew Jackson to remove the Cherokee people from their lands in the east to other lands in Oklahoma, further in the west. All told, about a dozen tribes experienced forced relocation during that era due to the Indian Removal Act. And tens of thousands of Native peoples died as a direct result of the Indian Removal Act. In 1862, we had the largest the largest execution, mass execution in the history of our nation was the hanging of the Dakota 38. The day after Christmas, 1862, after the War of 1862. 1864, we have the Sand Creek Massacre. 100, 150 Cheyenne and Arapaho men, women, and children on their treaty lands in the state of Colorado. U.S. Army, led by a Methodist pastor, comes over the hill. He orders all of them slaughtered. Later, it gets reported that the soldiers, the U.S. soldiers, are parading the genitalia down the streets of Denver, the genitalia of the natives that they slaughtered. 1863, we have the Long Walk. 
the ethnic cleansing of the territory of New Mexico. The removal of the Navajo and the Mescalero Apache from our traditional lands down to Bosque Redondo. Almost 10,000 people are forcibly removed in March. Hundreds of people die of exposure and starvation during the march. And almost a quarter of our people die while imprisoned in what can only be called a death camp. Now remember, 1862, 1864, 1863, who was president during these years? Well, these were Abraham Lincoln's years, right? See, in 1862, he signed the Pacific Railway Act, which allowed the land and the resources to complete the Transcontinental Railway. Within three years of signing that act, he literally has ethnically cleansed almost all the native nations from the state of Minnesota, the state of Colorado, and the territory of New Mexico, making way for the three of the primary major routes of the Transcontinental Railway, from Duluth, Minnesota to near Seattle, from Omaha, Nebraska, out to near San Francisco, and the southern route coming out near Los Angeles. Making Abraham Lincoln one of the most ethnically cleansing presidents, the most genocidal presidents in the history of our nation. 1979, we have the start of the Indian boarding schools. The literal goal of these schools was to kill the Indian to save the man. Native children were taken from their homes, forcibly, put into these military-style boarding schools, punished for speaking their languages, punished for practicing their culture. The stories of abuse that I've heard personally, psychological, mental, physical, emotional, sexual abuse that happened in these schools is gut-wrenching. In 1890, we have the massacre at Wounded Knee. 300 to 350 Native people slaughtered in a single day. And not only were they slaughtered, but the U.S. Army, the U.S. Congress, awards 20 medals of honor. 20 medals of honor for a single massacre. There was, if you ever go to Wounded Knee, it's, a beautiful, it's, a, it, it's on some beautiful land. It's a tragic place. But there's a hill. And then down the hill, there's a ravine. And when the fighting began, the, the um, U.S. Army had several, two or three Hotchkiss cannons, fired large bullets, multiple rounds, accurate for hundreds of yards. They've been firing, raining these bullets, these guns down on the Dakota people. And many of the people, including women and children, sought shelter in a ravine from these guns. Three of the Congressional Medals of Honor, the one given to William Austin, the one given to John Gresham, and the one given to Albert McMillan, were given specifically for flushing the Native peoples out of the ravine. William Austin says, while the Indians were concealed in a ravine, he assisted men on the skirmish line, directing their fire and using every effort to dislodge the enemy. John Grisham, it says, voluntarily led a party into a ravine to dislodge Sioux Indians concealed therein. He was wounded during this action. Albert McMillan, while engaged with Indians concealed in a ravine, he assisted the men on the skirmish line, directed their fire, encouraged them by example, and used every effort to dislodge the enemy. And we awarded medals of honor to these men who flushed these native peoples out of this ravine so they could be mowed down by military fire. 20 Congressional Medals of Honor. If you look back over our history, mid-1800s, our nation has reached about halfway, maybe a little less than halfway across the continent of actual states. We haven't quite established Oklahoma, Texas, Colorado, New Mexico. We've, we've reached about halfway through the states. If you go online and look up medals of honor, you can actually look them up both by war and by conflict. And if you look up medals of honor awarded for the Indian war campaigns, you will find that between 1839 and 1898, we award 425 medals of honor to U.S. soldiers who participated in the Indian War campaigns. And by 1900, we had completed our manifest destiny. 
gone all the way across the nation. Committing genocide, not only the Sand Creek Massacre, the Dakota Wars, the Long Walk, the Indian removals. Massacre after massacre after massacre. We awarded 425 medals of honor as a nation for the ethnic cleansing of this continent and the genocide of native peoples. In the 1800s, the estimated population of the United States was 5.3 million. In the 1900s, it was 76.2 million. In the 1800s, the estimated population of native peoples was about 600,000. In 1870, the lowest point, it reached 237,000. If you're doing the math on that, that's a 61.47% rate of genocide which is higher than Nazi Germany's genocide against the Jews during the Holocaust. In the 1500s, the world population was estimated about 480 million. In the 1900s, it was estimated about 1.6 billion. That's a 3.39% rate of growth. Europe went from an estimated population of 82 million to about 300 million for a 3.65% rate of growth. Africa, even with the horrors of the slave trade, grew from 63 million to 123 million for about a 1.782 rate of growth. The U.S. went from zero humans, at least white humans, to 76.2 million. The native population and a conservative estimate conservative estimate in 1500 is 6 million people in the continental United States. And the low in 1870 was 237,000. That's a 0.0395% rate of growth, which is actually a rate of genocide of 96.05%, which is higher than Rwanda, higher than the Holocaust, even higher than the wars, the Indian wars of the 1800s. 96.05% rate of genocide. It was so bad that in California, the very first governor of California, Peter Burnett, after the gold rush in the mid-1800s, California was the only one of the few states, maybe the only state that went straight to statehood, didn't become a territory first. And Peter Burnett, during his State of the State Address in 1851, this is what he said, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert. He's not saying these people are starving and we can't feed them. And he's not saying disease has broken out and we can't stop its spread. He's literally saying we cannot stop killing these people as we complete our manifest destiny. Why? Well, we have to remember the theology of promised lands. We have to remember the, the God-given right that you have when you have promised land, which is the right to commit genocide. In Joshua 10, verse 40, it says, So Joshua subdued the whole region, including the hill country, the Negev, the western foothills, and the mountain slopes, together with all their kings. He left no survivors. He totally destroyed all that breathed, just as the Lord, the God of Israel, had commanded. Promised land for one people is literally... God ordained genocide for another. And there's no regret, right? Because you have God's permission. You're an exceptional people. You have a land covenant with God of Abraham. It's a lie. <laughs> it's not true. Western Europe does not have a covenant with the God of Abraham. White people are not God's chosen people. And Turtle Island is not their promised land. This is why we teach the myth of American exceptionalism. This is why our infrastructure may be crumbling. 
our education may be subpar, our environment may be ready, may be ready to fall off a cliff, our institutions may be racist and sexist and white supremacist, but Americans cling to this myth that we are exceptional. Why? Because if we're not exceptional, if we don't somehow have God's permission and justification for our horrible and horrific past, then we're merely just another colonial genocidal nation. And that thought's unbearable to most people. So American exceptionalism is a coping mechanism for a nation, a white supremacist nation, that's in deep denial of its genocidal past as well as its current racist and, rex and sexist reality. This is why we cling, our nation, our leaders, Joe Biden and Donald Trump, our historians, our teachers, this is why we cling to this myth of American exceptionalism because if we are not somehow exceptional, if we are not somehow set apart and ordered by God to commit this horrific history, then we are just merely one of the most genocidal nations in the history of the world. And that thought is unbearable to most white people. So, President Trump, I don't know what school you've been attending. I don't know where you've been going, getting your education from. But I want you to know that Americans already teach the myth of American exceptionalism very deeply. It's a bipartisan value. It's false, it's not true, but it's very present. We need to actually do something else as a nation. Rather than filling our heads with these myths and these lies and these things that are untrue, we need to do what George Erasmus called common memory. In a quote that he used when he was writing about the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that happened in Canada. He used this quote that said, where common memory is lacking, where people do not share in the same past, there can be no real community. If you want to build community, he said, you have to start by creating a common memory. My fellow Americans, our nation is in deep need of a common memory. We have to give up this mythological history that we teach and propagate and shove down the throats of all Americans who come here. We have to be honest about who we are and how this nation was founded. We have to acknowledge that even the, the strife, the challenges we're facing today are not, the root cause are not from Donald Trump. Does he exacerbate them? Absolutely. Does he use them? Absolutely. They did not start with him and just getting Voting him out of office is not going to solve the problem. We have to actually deal with the lie behind that. Yes, we should vote Donald Trump out of office, but this is where I'm arguing as a nation. Electing Joe Biden, who very much believes in the myth of American exceptionalism, is not going to help. It's not going to fix the problems that we have. We need a president who is willing to face our history, to teach it, to model a different way, to build a common memory, so that for the very first time, we as a nation can have a healthy community. If you look back over the history of our nation, there is no point in US history where a healthy community existed across racial lines, even across gender lines. It doesn't exist. We have to go back and acknowledge that our past is deeply, deeply, deeply broken. And until we deal with our past, we're not going to be able to have a better, a whole future. This is the challenge we face. This is why both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, after the lynching, the murder of George Floyd, Donald Trump banned chokeholds through an executive order and Joe Biden suggested that we train police officers to 
shoot people non-lethally. Neither of them were interested in defunding the police or in radically rethinking and reforming our criminal justice system. And their solutions didn't work, right? We still had Jacob Blake. Wasn't choked, wasn't shot lethally, but still an incredible injustice. We have to deal with our foundations. We have to deal with the fact that we've institutionalized white supremacy. We've constitutionally protected the institution of slavery in our criminal justice system. We have to abolish slavery. There's a clause in the 13th Amendment. The amendment reads, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime, whereof the party has been duly convicted shall exist within the United States. There's a clause keeping slavery legal in prison. If we want to address the problem, Kenosha, Minneapolis, people of color. We have to address the foundations. We need to abolish slavery. And I promise you, neither Donald Trump nor Joe Biden have any interest in doing that. Why? Because acknowledging that it's there breaks their myth of American exceptionalism. And neither of them are willing or able to look back upon our nation's history with honesty. In a future live stream, I'm going to talk about what I call the trauma of white America that comes from a multi-generational communal manifestation of a complex perpetration-induced traumatic stress that actually keeps white Americans from acknowledging this history and from moving forward in a healthy way. They're not victims of trauma, but they're, they're, they're experiencing it. It's a perpetration-induced traumatic stress, is my theory. And I'll talk more about it later. But right now, we, just, we have to acknowledge that this myth of American exceptionalism is not helping anybody. It's keeping white America in denial. And it's continuing to damage and justify violence and injustice against women and people of color. And until we can end this myth of American exceptionalism, which is based on the lie of white supremacy, we're not going to be able to move forward. So I propose, rather than propagating this myth, this lie, that we find a way to begin teaching and creating a common memory. Not for the sake of condemning and shaming people, but for the sake of building healthier community, acknowledging what's been done in the past, and finding a real way to move forward. One of the key proposals in my campaign is the United States of America needs a national dialogue on race, gender, and class. Conversation I would put on par with Truth and Reconciliation Commission if that's happened elsewhere. I wouldn't call ours reconciliation, though, because reconciliation implies there was a previous harmony, which isn't true. Again, that's referring to the myth of American exceptionalism. We used to be great, now we're not anymore. I would call ours truth and conciliation. And it's the key plank of my platform. One of the things I'm adamant we need if we're going to find a way to move forward. A national dialogue on race, gender, and class. So I want to encourage you to look at our history accurately, honestly. I want to encourage you to reject this myth of American exceptionalism and reject the lie of white supremacy. I want you to take an honest look at our history so that we can find a way to move forward, so that we can have healthier community. Our campaign is trying to do something that's never been done before. We've never done this before. Our goal is to build a nation where for the very first time we the people truly means all the people. And we've never had that before. And we don't have to wait 250 years for it to take place. We can have it today. 
I can't help my relatives. I hope this is helpful. I'm going to continue to do some more of these live streams in the morning, even a bit early like this, because there's a lot of things that we have to teach and talk about. There's a lot of reasons. Right now, our campaign is not getting a lot of attention because our nation doesn't know how or doesn't even want to talk about these things. But I want to use my platform to lay out this history so that people can have a better understanding of why I have the proposals I'm making, why I have the policies I'm doing, why I'm running my campaign the way I'm running it. When I started my campaign 18 months ago or 15 months ago, I framed it as an 18-month journey of understanding U.S. history, an 18-month journey of creating common memory. I never quite got the national platform I had hoped for. But as our platform continues growing, I want to continue to teach this history so that we can create this common memory, so that we can move forward in a more healthy way. Hope you have a good day, my relatives. Walk in beauty, and may we learn how to walk in beauty together.